Hello, my name is Jonathan Kaufman. I'm a reader in palliative care at the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London. And it's a, a great pleasure to talk to you about something which people often don't want to talk about, which is palliative and end of life care. When people have asked some of my colleagues who work in palliative care what they do in their everyday jobs, the response is when they hear what people in palliative care do are quite interesting. I've been told that the brave ones lean in and look very earnestly or very seriously at my colleagues and say, what they do must be incredibly gloomy and very, very depressing. And they look very, 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 very uneasy. And some people just don't want to talk about the topic at all and look very awkward and find a very quick way to change the subject to literally anything else. I've been working in palliative care research, gosh, for nearly 20 years. And I've observed that over that period, that people are very, very reluctant to talk about that thing called death and dying. So I'm going to jump in right at the deep end and tell you that we are all going to die. So despite the best efforts of people who are working in the field of medicine and science and who've made incredible leaps and bounds to sort out so many of the illnesses that we experience, include COVID-19, which we've been going through a, a very, very chaotic experience over the last few weeks and months. We have failed miserably to eradicate death, which stands firmly fixed at 100% of all of us. So the bad news out of the way, there is some good news. So over the last 150 years or so, what we have managed to do very successfully is to extend our sell-by date or our best for date. So with the benefit of getting rid of infections and improvements in childbirth and eradicating poor sanitation and improving nutrition, and performing very, very complicated operations, we've managed to live much longer than we used to live. And this really contradicts a 16th century philosopher called Montaigne, who wrote that to die of age is rare, singular, and an extraordinary death. It is the last and extremest kind of deaths. And of that note, my colleague, Dr. Catherine Evans, published a paper in a very, very important medical journal a few years ago that shed light on the growing number of people who were getting to not 90 years of age, but 100 years of age. And she wanted to understand in more detail what they were dying of and where they were dying. And what she certainly found was that the number of people who get to over 100 years of age is increasing dramatically. And that's really a success story. But we have to die from something. And I'm very interested in understanding what we die of, and very importantly, the experience of how we die. So most of us in this room will die from a whole range of different illnesses and diseases. Some of us might die suddenly, from a heart attack, about a fifth of us actually. About one in two of us will have cancer in our lifetime, but only a quarter of us will die from cancer. We've managed very successfully to cure many cancers. Many of us will experience what we refer to as organ failure, where bits of our bodies just fail, like our hearts or our lungs or our nervous system. And some of us will die from frailty, or just getting very, very, very old. So what's really of interest to my colleagues who are doctors and nurses is the manner in which we die and how we can support those individuals at different points during their illness to make the symptoms that they experience as well as how they feel much more easy to bear. So with that, we come on to a really interesting question, which is, what are my colleagues trying to achieve? Well, we often talk about what a good death might be. And I suppose it might be quite reasonable for you to ask yourselves, 
what a good death would look like seems a bit crazy as a question, but it's an important one to ask. I've interviewed many hundreds of patients and family members about their experience of serious illness. And I've also interviewed a great many doctors and frontline nurses. And amongst the many lessons that I learned from them, I think I've discovered two things that might be really interesting. Number one, in medicine and in society, it seems that we have failed miserably to recognise that people have really, really important priorities to serve. Priorities that they want us to serve. Besides just living longer, as we saw in one of the previous slides, people want to be sure that they can think and share their feelings with other people. We talk about this in terms of their cognitive function, their ability to think about things and to make their thoughts known to others. They want to be with their loved ones or their pets or both. They want to drink their favourite whiskey or bottle of gin or, and do things which make them happy. And the second thing I learned from speaking to people was the most reliable way to learn what people's priorities are, and there are very sophisticated ways of doing that, is to ask them. And typically, we don't ask people. So when people have asked questions about what a good death looks like. They focus on lots of really interesting, highly complex interrelated issues, like being free of pain and being free of distressing symptoms, ensuring that their family is supported and that they don't feel a burden to them, and having their priorities or preferences listened to. And when they are listened to, that health and social care professionals do something with that information making sure that they feel as if they are at peace as their death approaches. And very, very importantly, making sure that the care that's being provided to them is really tied up and well planned and that each of the healthcare professionals or social care professionals who see them know what the other ones are doing. It seems really logical. So perhaps if we go back to what a good death is, maybe this is the kind of environment that is not representative of what people might think a good death is. An environment where there are lots of noisy bits of kit that go beep all day long with lots of lights, horrid fluorescent lights, and lots of staff running around looking really, really busy. And very, very little space for family of all ages to surround that person who is dying. And instead, perhaps a good death looks like this, dying on that person's terms, surrounded by people who connect with that person emotionally and physically, people who tell them that they love them, people who can reach out and hold them, dying in your own home, which is something I'll talk to you about in a few moments' time, rather than being in a hospital room. And here's a wonderful picture of a woman who died in a hospital, but the thing that made her death a good death was that she was able to connect with her beautiful horse, who she had cared for for many years. And her horse was brought to the car park, and this woman was taken down in the lift and wheeled out gently to into the car park so she could connect with her beautiful horse once again. So how do we make a good death happen? Well, there is a solution to this, and we often refer to this as a thing called palliative care. And this is a medical specialty that includes doctors and nurses and social workers and physiotherapists and psychologists and many, many other people who pick through all the different problems that people arrive with when they are living with a life-limiting condition and sort out which are the most important problems that they can manage there and then and then sort out the other problems which can't be sorted out immediately but need action later on. And they ask patients very, very important questions about what their understanding is about their illness or their condition at that time. What are their fears and worries about the future? What are their goals if time is short? What outcomes would be unacceptable to them? And with that, the healthcare professionals find out from the patient what's most important to them. And they can work with that information and plan care so it is tied in to what the patients want. One of the original people or the original professionals who developed past care was a woman called Dame Dr Cicely Saunders. And this is a photograph of her at St Christopher's Hospice 
way back in the 1970s. And Cicely Saunders originally trained as a hospital social worker and then as a nurse. And then she was so worried about the experience of people who were dying from cancer. And when she spoke about this to one of her medical colleagues, they said, Cicely, if you want to make a difference, you are going to have to train as a doctor. So she did, and she trained at St Thomas's Hospital, which is part of King's College London now. So she became what we now refer to as a multi-professional team. She looked at people's problems, not just through the lens of medicine, but through nursing and also social work as well. And she was instrumental in thinking about pain, not just as a physical phenomena that sits within nerves and affects that person, but also the manner in which pain, let's call it distress, affects the whole of that person in terms of how they feel in themselves, their emotions, how it makes them anxious or distressed and how, very importantly, it might touch on how they believe in God or how they connect with their faith or spiritual beliefs. And she referred to that as total pain. And she argued that in order to achieve what we now refer to as a good death, palliative care would need to be equipped with the skills and the knowledge, not just to manage the physical symptoms that people might experience, but also the many other troubles that people arrive with at the end of life. For example, problems with relationships with family members or friends, things that they would have liked to have achieved but didn't. And it's the purpose of palliative care to unpick all the different issues that people experience and try and find solutions for them. And to give you a little bit of an illustration about what palliative care can do through the lens of what Cicely Saunders referred to as total pain. I'm going to talk to you about a patient I interviewed a few years ago called Rebecca. And at the time I interviewed her, she was a 34 year old single parent and she had cancer. And when I interviewed her on the hospital ward, she was very, very thin indeed. and very, very distressed from her pain. She described her pain in ways which were quite frightening and she suggested that her pain was a bit like a volcano starting in her feet and coming out of her head really fast. And she said it was a little bit like the devil and she wanted to curl up at night and try and remove the pain from herself, but it wouldn't go. Now that would seem horrific enough by anyone's standards, but the things that frightened Rebecca the most was that while she was in hospital, she was separated from her six-year-old daughter who she really adored and she could no longer care for. And that hurt her so enormously. So it was the task of a palliative care team to sift through her problems and try and manage her physical pain, but also to try and understand her concerns about her daughter and to find some sort of solution to how her daughter would be cared for in the future and to bring the two together for as many moments as was physically possible in the final few days of Rebecca's life. Now I could tell you lots of stories about people like Rebecca, but I think it would be interesting to talk about a really interesting study that took place at a hospital called Massachusetts General Hospital in the United States just a few years ago, where they tried to understand on a much bigger scale whether providing palliative care to a group of patients with small, lungs, small cell lung cancer was better than just giving them the usual care that many of them would typically have received. So in this trial, which we refer to as a randomized control trial, one group were randomly selected to receive the usual care that they normally got. And the other group got the usual care, but they also got the palliative care where they had discussions with palliative care professionals about the sorts of questions I talked about earlier, about their understanding of their illness, about what might happen in relation to their future and what they considered to be unacceptable to them. So these patients who received palliative care made very important decisions about what was unacceptable to them. They didn't want third or fourth line chemotherapy, which was quite experimental for this group of patients. And there was no real surety that it would provide any benefits to them. 
And as a consequence of making those decisions and having contact with the power to care team to make decisions that they wanted happen, they experienced improvements in their physical symptoms. They were admitted far less to hospital. They got less of what we refer to as aggressive care, like lots and lots of chemotherapy. Far more of them died at home, which is the most preferred place of death for many people. And so importantly, they had what they understood as an improved quality of life. They enjoyed their time much more. And something which was really interesting in this study was that they lived longer. On average, they lived 25% longer than the group of patients who just received standard care. So this was a really interesting experiment. And if this were a medicine, it would be worth millions and millions of pounds and everyone would be fighting over it. Who wouldn't want this? And I think the problem with the reality is that people don't often get passive care is that we don't talk about the reality that people will die. And as a consequence of that, people don't have the opportunity of benefiting from high quality end of life care. Doctors don't talk about death with their patients. They're scared to talk about the reality that their patients are going to die. And I think as a consequence of that, they kick that box down the street. And many of the patients who could benefit from high quality end of life or palliative care don't get it. And it's interesting that we don't talk about it because over the last hundred years, I think we have sanitized death from everyday discussion. Some people talk about it as the veiling of death. Once upon a time, we were more exposed to death. Our grandparents and great grandparents were far more familiar with the reality that people died. It's not something we teach a great deal to medical students or nursing students, but that has changed. And there is a great doctor called Atol Gawande who said in his book called Being Mortal, I learned a lot in medical school, but mortality or dying wasn't one of them. We had no greater unfixables than aging and death itself. And the reality was, I really wasn't prepared for to do anything about them when I'd finish. So the other questions that we're really interested in in palliative care is where do people die? And how can we change the location of where people die? Now, a great many studies have taken place that have identified that if people were asked a question,